Love you guys. You can go ahead and grab a seat. As you do, I want to welcome you to Christ Fellowship and also want to welcome you if you're joining us online. A special shout out to our men and women serving in the armed forces around the world tuning in today. We love you. Thank you for your service. My name is Ryan, and I have the privilege of looking after our student ministry and our young adults ministry here at Christ Fellowship, and I'm unbelievably excited um, to be able to share with you from the Word of God today. As we jump in, I'm wondering if there's anybody in the house this morning who's ever shown up somewhere wearing the wrong thing. Anybody ever shown up wearing the wrong thing? Like maybe you were really overdressed for an occasion, or you were really underdressed when you showed up for something. Maybe you have a friend who told you it was a costume party when it wasn't. You should cut them out of your life in Jesus' name. Uh, or if you're anything like my wife, she's just a little bit obsessed with making sure that she has the right thing on, right? So it's like, where are we going? Who's going to be there? What are we doing again? Just like making sure, because when you show up somewhere wearing the wrong thing, it's, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And there's a freedom that comes when you're wearing the right thing. I've had a few moments in my life where I've shown up wearing the wrong thing, probably the worst of which, I was a sophomore in college. I was dating Christine, who's now my wife, and she was a student at the University of Florida. And so I was really excited. Well, yeah, three people are excited about that. And uh, one, I was really excited because I was gonna go up and visit her in Gainesville, and we were gonna go to a football game. Now, I wasn't much of a college football fan at the time. In fact, to this day, most of my friends make fun of me because I'm really just not a sports guy. And, uh, and so I went up to Gainesville and I was there for the weekend and we were gonna go to this football game. And when I got dressed that morning to go meet her, I don't know why I did this. I, I don't think I've done it before or since, but I chose that day to put on a purple T-shirt. So we go to this game and I'm sitting in the student section at the University of Florida in the swamp in a sea of orange and blue, right? In a purple t-shirt. And from the moment I walked into the stadium, I mean, if looks could kill, I would have died that day. It, it was like everybody was looking at me, staring at me. And I'm like, what's up with this place? These people are so mean. Why, how do they know I don't belong here? Like, what, what is wrong with these people? And then it all made sense when the opposing team ran out of the tunnel because it was the LSU Tigers that day, right? And if you're not a sports fan like me, the LSU Tigers, purple and gold. And so here I am in the middle of the student section wearing the colors of the opposing team. And it just got worse because the Tigers actually won that day and everyone literally wanted to kill me, right? And the reality is I just, I couldn't enjoy the game. I couldn't enjoy the experience. I couldn't enjoy the moment because I was wearing the wrong thing. And my fear is that too many Christians wake up every day and walk out into the world wearing the wrong thing. See, there's a freedom that comes when we put on the right stuff. There's a freedom that comes when we're wearing the right thing. If you remember this year, the word that God has spoken over our house through pastors Todd and Julie is the word freedom, right? It's what we believe God wants for each and every one of us, for you and for me, God wants freedom, right? And the reality is that we have to fight for freedom if we want it. And in Ephesians chapter six, we read a passage of scripture where Paul is trying to tell us how we ought to dress for this fight for freedom. Let me read the word of God to, to you today. Here's what it says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Paul says, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and have, after having done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, he says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 17. Now, the reality is we could spend all day talking about the various aspects of this passage of scripture. We could spend a long time trying to understand each piece of God's armor and how it works and what it is. But here's what I know. At the end of the day, you and I, 
We'll have a better chance in our fight for freedom. We'll have a better chance in our fight for freedom if we understand a few truths about the armor of God. Here's the first truth. I'd love for you to write this down. The armor of God is suitable for all ages. <laughs> the armor of God is suitable for all ages. Now, I know that most of you in the room are more spiritual than I am, but I'm just gonna be honest with you for a moment. When I hear the phrase armor of God, what I envision in my mind is like cheesy plastic kids' toys. Like maybe that's just the stage of life I'm in, but when I hear the phrase armor of God, I picture like little kids' plastic toys. Like I just do. And, and I think that perhaps there are many of us in the room, like when we hear this, this passage of scripture, the armor of God, we almost tune out, maybe even unintentionally, because it feels a little bit like something you just, you learn to sing about in vacation Bible school. If you grew up around church or you, you memorize it in Sunday school. And somehow as we get older, it just feels like it doesn't fit anymore. Like when I hear the phrase armor of God, I just think of something I can go on amazon.com and order for $29.99 get it shipped to my house, prime delivery, two days later, we got it, right? In fact, I did that. This is a picture of my son, Declan, four and a half. He's wearing the armor of God available on amazon.com. Looking pretty good, I might add. And just because I think it's awesome, this is our one and a half year old Kinley trying to put it on too, wearing the armor of God in Jesus' name. And that's kind of what I picture when I hear this passage of scripture, these kind of plastic kids' toys. What's the problem with that? It doesn't fit me. <laughs> I can't put that on. I tried it. Look, it just, it doesn't work. Like those things, they, they don't fit me at all. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. The, the belt, I had to hold up for the picture. I literally couldn't bring it all the way around me. And if we picture the armor of God in this way, it just, it doesn't fit. So let me ask you a question. What if one of the ways the enemy has neutralized the power of this passage of scripture in our lives is by convincing us that it's just for kids. The reality is that as we grow, we actually need the armor of God more and more every single day of our lives. It is suitable for all ages. The box knows it. The box said ages three and up. <laughs> so it's meant for you and me. We need to understand if we wanna fight for freedom that the armor of God is suitable for all ages. You and I, we need to make the decision each and every day to wake up and to suit up, to put on the armor of God, to ask the Lord to help us to put on the, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, that we would have the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the belts of truth, that we would be ready with the peace that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got to put it on because the armor of God is suitable for all ages. Why? Here's another truth is the armor of God is essential for survival. It's essential for survival. You and I need to understand that this is not optional for us as believers to put on the armor of God. In fact, the way that Paul writes about it in Ephesians chapter six, he, he doesn't say, if you face a spiritual struggle. He doesn't say, if the day of evil comes. He doesn't say, if the enemy attacks. No, 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 no. He says, when. When that happens, you and I need to understand that this armor of God, it's essential for our survival. Why? Because we are all fighting a spiritual battle. Part of what Paul is trying to do in this passage of scripture is help you and I to realize that there is a war going on in the spiritual realms. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place and it is more real than the chair that you sit in right now. And we as believers, as men and women of God, as people of faith, we need to suit up and prepare for the spiritual battle that we step into every single day. And in the same way a soldier would suit up for battle physically, you and I, we need to prepare spiritually for the battle that we are sure to face because if we don't, when we are attacked, when we have a spiritual struggle, when the day of evil comes, we won't be able to stand. See, the reality is that unless we put on God's protection over our lives, we cannot stand in the battle that we are sure to face. Are you wearing the armor? Of God. Here's another truth. The armor of God is almost entirely for defense. Almost. 
It's almost entirely for defense. Like if you read this passage of scripture and you begin to study the armor of God, you will see some things. And one of the things that you ought to notice is that it's almost entirely for defense, meaning that he talks about the belt of truth, right? He talks about the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, feet ready with the gospel. All of those pieces are for defense. And then at the very end of this passage of scripture, he kind of tucks in some. He says, oh, and by the way, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So all of these pieces of armor that you and I are issued for spiritual battle, they're almost entirely for defense. They're almost entirely for our protection, right? But at the end of this passage, we see there's actually only one offensive weapon that you and I are given, The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What does that mean? Everything else is meant to protect us and to keep us safe. But there is only one thing with which we can fight back against the attacks of the enemy. It is the word of God, which is our weapon. And you and I need to understand that we have been given in the word of God such a special, precious gift. It is our weapon. This is the way that we fight back against the attacks of the enemy. Do you, do you know what the oldest tactic in Satan's war against mankind is? The oldest tactic in Satan's war against mankind is to get you and I to question the word of God. That's it. It's literally, I would say it this way. It's the oldest trick in the book. Like if you go back to the pages of Genesis, if you read there, you will see that Satan's oldest tactic in the war against mankind is to get you and I to question the word of God. How do we know that? Well, if you were to read the narrative of Genesis, right, what you will discover is an eternal, everlasting God from which all things are created. He creates everything, right? And if you read that story, what happens is that God creates the universe with his words. He literally speaks everything into existence, speaks light into existence, speak land into existence, literally breathes stars out from his mouth. But there's a moment in the narrative where everything changes because instead of speaking things into existence, God reaches down into his creation and he forms and he fashions mankind. It's the first thing in scripture that God touches, you and I. See, everything else was formed with his words, but you and I were worthy of more than a syllable. God reached into creation and he formed you from the dust of the ground. It's why you and I are different than everything else in all of creation because God, when he made you, he got his hands dirty. You are special. You are created by God. You're set apart. But as you read the story, you'll figure out it's only a couple of chapters before we mess it all up, right? I mean, Genesis chapter three, we're only three chapters in and we've already blown it because as God made all of these things and stepped back and said, it is good and stepped back from man and said, it is very good. There was only one commandment that was issued by God in the beginning. He said, hey, all that I've created, it is for you, enjoy. But this one tree, the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from that tree. And so in Genesis chapter three, what happens? Satan slithers his ugly little head into this story and he attacks at a point of weakness. He, he goes to Eve and he asks a question, four words that change the trajectory of history forever. Did God really say? Satan's oldest tactic in the war against mankind is to get you to question the word of God. So Eve responds, you know what she says? He says, did God really say that you should not eat from that tree? And Eve says this, she says, yes. God said that we should not eat it or even touch it. You know what happens in that moment? Eve misquotes God. She misquotes God. She gets it wrong. See, God gave them only one commandment for their protection. Everything I have created is all for you. This one tree, don't eat from its fruit. But Eve adds to the word of God. She puts in her own rules and her own regulations. And then all of a sudden believes somehow that God is not trying to protect her, but rather to limit her. We actually do the same thing to this day. God gives us a commandment or a principle in scripture and it's enough. He's trying to protect us. But we add all of these rules and regulations that we think are a part of what God says. Said, but we made it about something else entirely. Don't miss it. We don't need to add to the word of God. His word for us is enough, but she misquotes him. God told us not to eat it or even touch it. Okay, so why did she misquote God? 
Well, if you read the narrative of Genesis, here's the timeline. God creates Adam. Then God speaks the command, don't eat from the tree. And then he creates Eve. So Satan attacks Eve. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that she's a woman. She doesn't know the word of God for herself. Why? Because she only heard it through Adam. So here's my fear. Perhaps many of us in this room, we don't know the word of God for ourselves. See, a lot of us, we've kind of maybe been around this place for a while, and maybe you know the word of God because you've heard it at church, or you've heard it from a pastor, or you, you heard it from your parents, you heard it from your friends, you heard it from your mima, or whatever you call her, but you don't maybe know the word of God for yourself. And if that's true, then when Satan slithers his ugly little head into your story, and asks the same question that he's been asking since the dawn of creation, did God really say? If we don't know the word of God for ourselves, here's the best answer I can give. I don't know. I don't know. Did God really say that you were special? Did God really say that you were chosen? Did God really say that you were loved, that you were created on purpose for a purpose? Did God really say that he has a plan and a purpose for your lives? Did God really speak those things over you? Whoa. I don't know. See, the word of God is our weapon. And the only way we fight back against the attacks of the enemy is to know this for ourselves. I don't, I don't think this is more clearly represented than in Matthew chapter four and in Luke chapter four. There's a, a story that maybe you've read before. It's the same story in both, um, both places. And it's the story of Jesus when he's led out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And what happens in this story in scripture is that Satan, the enemy of God, is trying to tempt the son of God, Jesus, to betray who he really is. See, he's trying to He's trying to tempt him to disobey God and to do it his own way, right? And so Satan, when he attacks Jesus, do you know what the enemy of God uses to try to tempt the son of God? You know what he uses? The word of God. Satan quotes scripture to Jesus to try to get him to mess up and to falter. And the only reason that Jesus is able to stand firm against the attacks of the enemy is because he fights back with what? the word of God. And not just the word of God. Don't miss this. It's not just that he's memorized a few verses. That's not the point. Jesus fights back with the word of God, correctly understood because he knows the heart of God. Satan knew all the words, but Jesus knew the heart of God. See, there's a big difference. But let me ask you a question that wrecked me <laughs> a few years ago. Does Satan know the word of God better than I do? Because if he does, I'm in trouble. Because he's gonna come into my life and he's gonna attack me. He's gonna try to get me to question who God has told me that I am. He's gonna ask me those same four words. Did God really say? And he'll even use scripture and twist scripture to try to do it. And if I don't know the word of God, if I don't understand the heart of God, then I can't fight back against the attacks of the enemy. See, the word of God, it is our weapon. And you and I need to be equipped for spiritual battle. In Jesus' name, amen. We need to be ready to fight back with the word of God. I think of the moment in a movie or a TV show, maybe you've seen something like this before where a soldier or a police officer would sit down in front of a table and on fr in front of them, they would have their weapon, right? And they would actually like kind of take it apart, clean it, put it all back together, get it loaded up and ready. I've even watched scenes where they would start a timer and do it and put it back together and time themselves and just try to get faster and faster and faster. Why? Because they need to know their weapon so intimately that when they march out into battle, no matter what goes wrong, no matter what jams up, no matter what happens, they know exactly what to do and exactly how to fix it. Why? Because their life depends on it. What if we treated the word of God, our weapon, with that kind of intensity? What if we knew this word, our weapon, so intimately that no matter what came our way, no matter what tripped us up, no matter what jam we experienced, we knew exactly where to go, exactly what to say, and exactly what to do because we know that the word of God is our weapon. Come on, church. We've got a gift from God in this book that so many of us, we, we march into battle unarmed. No good soldier would do that. And yet so many of us, we march in, out into battle and we are unarmed. But the word of God is our weapon and we need to understand that we have been given 
a precious gift in the word of God. Don't settle for just using all of the defensive pieces of armor. Don't just settle for protection, but God will actually, he wants to give you something with which you can fight back. Here's the final truth. The armor of God is actually incomplete. The armor of God is actually incomplete. Now, before you write a nasty email about me to Pastor Todd, let me explain what I mean to you by that. If you were to read this passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter six, as you go through these elements of the armor of God and you think about what we have been given, that we have been given the belt of truth upon which everything hinges. We've been given a breastplate of righteousness that comes from right standing with God and walking in his ways. We've been given the helmet of salvation that can affect everything that we see and think and do. We've been given the, sp- the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. We're ready with the gospel of peace. As you think about all of those elements, what you may eventually come to realize is that there's no piece of armor for your back. There's nothing there to cover your back. In fact, I I took a picture of my son Declan the other day when he had everything on, just to prove it to you. Nothing on his back. Now, that's really interesting because we are given a lot of other elements, right, for our protection. One of those elements that we're given is a shield of faith, for example. And when Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter six, he's not, he's not using a word that refers to cheesy plastic kids' toys. In fact, the word that he used for shield, he's, he's referencing a real Roman shield that would have looked a little something like this, right? It was large, it was, it was strong, and this is something that they would have carried into battle with them, right? And actually, the idea was that a Roman soldier, he could take this and use it, and behind it, he could hide, completely covered, completely Shielded. This is how he would protect himself from the flaming arrows of the enemy. Unless you're like a little fat like me, then a little bit might hang out on the side. But other than that, you know, like they would be able to disappear behind this shield because the shield gave them protection from the attacks of the enemy. But yet behind them, they would have been exposed. Now, some people might tell you, and they're not entirely wrong, that that's because as Christian men and women, we're never supposed to retreat. We're never supposed to run. We're never supposed to turn our backs on a fight. And, and sometimes that is true. But actually, there's some specific instructions in Scripture where you and I as Christian people are told to, to run, to flee, not to stand. Like, for example, when it comes to sexual temptation, you don't stand in that battle. You turn and you run. So perhaps the reason that we're not given any armor for our backs is because You're supposed to have mine, and I'm supposed to have yours. See, this is a picture of what it's supposed to look like, that we would fight together. In fact, the Bible says it this way. A person standing can be attacked. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. How many of you know what that feels like in Jesus' name? But two can stand back to back and conquer. Come on, how many of you know that you need somebody who's got your back? You need somebody who's going to stand with you. And this is the way that we protect ourselves in the spiritual battle that we are sure to face. See, this is not an individual fight. It's not just that you would put on the armor of God and then go up against your spiritual enemy. This is not a one-on-one battle. It's not even a two-on-one battle because Roman soldiers, they never fought alone. They didn't march it out into battle in isolation, but instead they moved together. They were a part of a legion. They were a part of an army. There was strength in their numbers. See, what you and I need to understand is that the spiritual battle that we are facing, this is something we have to fight against together. And as these soldiers marched in, out into battle carrying their shield, there would come a moment if they needed to take new territory or they needed to push back the enemy where the Roman commander would shout out the word testudo and they would fall into formation that would look a little bit like this. The word testudo actually means tortoise or turtle, which is kind of awesome, but it would actually create a shell of protection. And it was in this formation that these soldiers could push back the enemy and could take new ground. Do you know what this is? This is a picture of Christian community. This is a picture of what your life and my life are supposed to look like because this is not just about me putting on the armor of God. No, 
This is about linking your shield of faith together with some men and women of faith who are gonna fight alongside of you because it is in this formation that we can push back the powers of darkness and we can take new ground in Jesus' name. This is a picture of what our lives ought to look like. I know these are heavy guys. You can go ahead and, hey, can you give them a hand? Thank you guys for what incredible demonstration. So why does that matter? Because too many of us fight alone. Too many of us are fighting and struggling alone. But this is not an individual sport. This is something that we were meant to do together. So here's the question. Who are the few who are gonna fight with you? Who are the people that you have put in your life, who stand shoulder to shoulder, you can link your shield of faith with them so that you can take new ground in Jesus' name. See, this is a picture of the kind of community that each and every one of us are called to. So here's the reality. If you put on the armor of God and I don't, you're still vulnerable. If I put on the armor of God and you don't, then I'm still vulnerable. If nobody's got your back, then you're still vulnerable. Because here's what I know, in your fight for freedom, in my fight for freedom, we need two things. We need the armor of God and the people of God. If you're gonna get serious about your fight for freedom and experiencing all that God has for you, you need the armor of God and you need the people of God. If you only have one and you don't have the other, it's gonna be a pretty difficult fight. You need the armor of God and you need the people of God. As we respond to the word of God together this weekend, I wanna give you one step, and then I wanna pray two prayers. Some of you walked into this place this weekend and as you watched that visual, you watched that demonstration, you know that maybe you've been trying to fight this battle on your own. Maybe you just have a sense that it feels like it's you up against the world or you're always on your own. Or maybe you're like, I don't have any Christian people in my life or I've got one friend or I've got two friends, but I don't have a legion of people who are gonna link arms with me. Well, then you have a step to take today because you don't have to leave this campus without finding those people, without finding brothers and sisters, men and women of faith who are going to link their shield with yours so that you can take new ground in Jesus' name. It's a picture of Christian community. You don't have to leave here without it. That's why across all of our locations this weekend, we've got a place where you can come have a conversation about getting in a group because that's what a group looks like. That's why we're always pushing you to community because you need people. You need a few who are gonna fight with you. Don't leave here today if you don't have that kind of community, you've not experienced that kind of family of God. Don't leave here today without getting some people who are gonna link arms and fight with you. That's your step for many of us here today. Gotta get in community. But I wanna pray two prayers as we respond to the word of God together this weekend. The first prayer is gonna be for anyone in the room who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a Christian but I need to put on the armor of God afresh and anew and I need to make a commitment every single day to be ready to fight for freedom. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands because I wanna pray the armor of God over you before you leave this weekend. But the second prayer I wanna pray is for anyone who maybe wandered onto one of our campuses this weekend and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus. If that's you, we are so glad that you are here, but you have a step to take as well. And in fact, this passage of scripture, it speaks to those who don't have a relationship with God through Jesus. If you read in Ephesians chapter six, this armor of God passage, if you remember, what's the first thing that Paul instructs us to put on? The belt of truth. When was the last time you got dressed and put on your belt first? That don't make no sense. That's not how you get dressed. It only makes sense when you understand that the truth is not a thing. The truth is a person. His name is Jesus. 
and the freedom that God has for you, the life that God has for you, it all starts with putting on the belt of truth. His name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And upon him, everything else in your life hinges. You gotta get that right first. And so I also wanna pray for anyone who might be in one of our locations today who doesn't have a relationship with God, but you want one. He's got a life for you. He's got freedom for you. He loves you. He died for you. And you can experience relationship with him today. So across all of our locations, I wanna ask that you would close your eyes and you would bow your heads with me as we pray. And the first prayer that I wanna offer again is for anybody who would say, I am a Christian, I am a follower of Jesus, but I need to ask for the Lord to help me put on his armor so that I can stand firm in the spiritual battle that I'm sure to face. If you want that prayer today, you are a Christian and you need to put on the armor of God. I just ask you would raise a hand across any one of our locations so that I can pray the armor of God over you, God's protection over your life as you fight for freedom, that you would be equipped for spiritual battle in Jesus' name. God, for my brothers and sisters who are raising their hands towards heaven right now. God, help us to suit up spiritually. God, we want your protection over our lives because we know it's essential for survival. We know that we need it. And so God, help us to put on the helmet of salvation. God, that everywhere we go, everything we say, everything we do, it would all be looked at through the lens of our salvation, that it would make a difference in our daily lives, even in our thoughts, Jesus. Help us to put on the helmet of salvation. God, I pray that each and every one of us would be protected by the breastplate of righteousness, God, that comes from right relationship with you, that comes from walking in your ways, from walking in your principles. God, help us to be righteous in your sight. God, help us to raise the shield of faith, God, with which we can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. God, help us to link link our shields with other believers, other men and women of God, so that we can push back the forces of darkness. God, help us to be ready with the gospel of peace. God, help us to be ready to teach it or share it or speak it or show it every single place that we go. God, give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Help us to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. May we know our weapon intimately so that we can fight back against the attacks of the enemy. Help us, God, to be ready to fight for freedom. The second prayer is if you're in this room and you're not a believer in Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God, but you want one. You know that this freedom, this life that God has for you, it all lies on the other side of a relationship with Jesus. You gotta get that right first. Everything else hinges on him. In just a moment, we're all gonna pray a prayer together, but if you're saying this prayer for the very first time, this is your moment. You're inviting Jesus into your life. You're beginning a relationship with God by understanding that he loves you, that he sent his son for you, that he died for you, and he rose again so that you can be in relationship with him. If that's you, just say this prayer a little bit louder as we all pray it together. Just say this, just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Make me new again. Forgive me of my sins. For the rest of my life, as best as I know how, I will live to honor you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen.